as the blissful aroma of God's word fills the sanctuary and saturates our soul, let us prepare our hearts for the preaching of his word through prayer. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we are continually tossed here and there by various trials and wickedness which does not cease to try to shake our faith in you. Oh, grant that we may yet stand firm on the promises that you have given us, those assurances that you have confirmed through your only begotten Son. Let us not despair in our great troubles but relying on your goodness, may we utter the groans to our groans to thee until the ripened time when you deliver us. We pray now that you open our hearts and minds to hear your holy word being proclaimed in Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I don't have to tell anybody here. This last week was a very extremely trying time. Many of us suffered without electricity, without heat, and even without water. These last few days have been challenging, have been challenging for us. It has been a time of hopelessness for some and a time of loneliness for others. Now, one of the things that I found very interesting that, that took place is, as Sandy and I were walking around our house without power, without electricity, without heat, at nighttime we were walking around with a candle in our, in our hands, right? We were walking around. One of the things that I noticed that I found very interesting was as we walked around in the darkness with a candle in our hand, we were casting shadows, shadows on the walls, on the ceiling, all over the place. We cast shadows with the candles. And when I saw that, it reminded me of a story about the, the Italian artist, the great Italian artist, uh, Michelangelo. And I've spoken about him before, but, but when I saw the shadows and the candles, it just reminded me about a story that was written about him. It is said that Michelangelo would paint his masterpieces with a brush on one hand and a candle on the other. Isn't that interesting? Interesting. Why would he do that? Well, the reason he did that was he did not want to cast his shadow on his masterpiece. And the light source that he was at the, of wherever he was painting would cast a shadow on the canvas or whatever masterpiece he was working on. So to prevent his shadow from overcoming his masterpiece, he would use he would get another candle and put it between his himself and the canvas, and then he would paint because it would eliminate the shadow. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting to 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 see something like that to know. The effects of shadows. Uh, theologian Joe uh, 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 Sproul says something very interesting regarding shadows and painting and all that. He says something like about that, about how Michelangelo painted. He said, that's the kind of attitude we should adopt if we are serious about wanting to display the masterpiece of God's glory on the canvas of our life. Isn't that beautiful? That's kind of neat to think of how shadows work. But what we're looking at as we're going through the book of Zechariah and the prophecies that he's going to talk about, we're going to have to interpret those prophecies because back then, what we're reading are the shadows of the reality that comes to being in the New Testament. We're looking at shadows. But we can interpret them now that we have the reality of Christ, the New Testament. This, 
this is a time. Uh, this is a time for where we must not live like Sandy and I in the shadows of, of, of our house in, in what some would deem as hopelessness, but we have to live in the reality of the comfort that God brings us. Why? Because God is aware. He was aware of everything that we were going through. He knew everything that was happening in a time of hopelessness, in a time of loneliness. As we will see in our passage, the Lord calls us to pray. The Lord calls us to prayer. Hey, what better, what a better reminder that our hope and trust is in God than when we're in prayer when we're communing, communing with God. That's what's taking place in our passage. The imagery of shadows and the reality of God is happening. The imagery of shadows and reality takes place throughout Holy Scripture, not just in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. The prophetic imagery of visions from Old Testament prophets are but shadows to the reality revealed to us in the New Testament. In the New Testament. This morning we're continuing the new sermon series that we're in from the book of Zechariah called Return to Me Today. We're going to look at the first of eight visions that were given by God to his prophet, Zechariah. There's some amazing stuff that we're going to talk about. You're going to have to get into these visions yourself. Uh, what The amazing thing, when I read these, is these eight visions were given to Zechariah in one night. That is, I, I can't imagine anything like that. So we're going to talk. We're going to lay some more groundwork as we as we start looking into the this vision, this first vision. But overall, this first vision, what we see in this first vision is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ making intercession for his people. That first vision is that is given to Zechariah. Now remember, Zechariah is looking at, he's talking about, well, we read what he's saying. There's shadows. The people back then saw shadows. It wasn't clear. We can see, we can see it clearly now that we have the New Testament. We have the rest of the story. We know what was going on. We know what it meant now. That's how we interpret it. God's mercy and grace come only through Jesus Christ who intercedes for his people, thereby bringing forth an overflow of prosperity for all eternity, all eternity for God's people. As we turn into this passage, the, one of the first things we need to realize is that it is a drama. It's a drama, like you're looking at a movie. It, it is something that's taking place. It's giving us a drama narrative. It's a vision. And this drama is broken down into three parts. It breaks down very easy into three parts. It breaks down into the, it gives us the background of the vision. It gives us the, the, uh, the circumstances of the vision. And then it gives us the message of the vision. And we're going to try to work through that really quick. But we'll start off with the background of the vision. Uh, it basically is laying out the setting for what is taking place, this vision, for us to understand, okay? Now, we right off the bat see something amazing. We see that the things that we read in the Bible and the events that took place in the Bible are not made up. They're, they take place in human history. And it tells us that. It's already told us that once, and it's telling us again in our passage. It gives us a time frame for when this happened. A specific time frame. Now, we, we recall what we spoke about last Sunday. The events that are taking place in the book of Zechariah are post-exilic. They're, meaning they're, they they're taking place after the Babylonian exile. Remember the Babylonian exile. Babylon comes... Uh, the people of God sinned against God, so he turns them over to their sinfulness. 
the empire of Babylon come in, comes in and destroys them, takes them captive, takes about a million men from Jerusalem and Judah captive and marches them 1,670 some odd miles to Babylon. Okay, now 70 years go by. Seven, about 70 years go by. Think about that. After 70 years, like you're probably, like if, you, if you and I were taken captive and we we're taken to Babylon and we're having a, and God is saying, hey, just, you know, just blend with the people, build your lives there. So they start learning the language. They start, they, I mean, they keep their customs as best they can, <clears throat> but their language starts changing. A lot of things happen in these 70 years. And by the way, if it was me, I would be dead by the end of the 70 years. I wouldn't even be there anymore. My kids would be there. So what happens after these 70 years is uh, another empire, the Persian Empire, comes in and, and defeats Babylon. And then the king uh, uh, Cyrus comes in and he says, okay, you go back wherever you came from. I'm still ruling over all this, but I'm going to allow you to go back. I want you to be happy, but you still have to pay taxes and all that good stuff. Okay, so he allows him to go back. He allows them to go back. So the, for the people of Israel, the Israelites are allowed to go back to Jerusalem. But get this. Remember, about a million Israelites were taken captive. Only a remnant, only a remnant returns. About 50,000, 50,000 men return back. They come back to a destroyed land. They come back to rebuild their homes, to rebuild a city, to rebuild their worship, their house of God. That's what's taking place. We're seeing all this taking place. Now, we know, and we talked about this last week, Zechariah is a contemporary with another prophet, Haggai. Haggai's ministry only lasted a few months. Zechariah's ministry lasted longer than that, lasted for a few years. So we're specifically focusing on the ministry of Zechariah. Now it starts, we're told, right at the first of the book, it starts in the eighth month of the second year of the reign of a pagan ruler. It states the name of the pagan ruler for us, Darius. But now in our text today, we're told that some, a little bit of time passed, and now it's the 11th month of the second year of Darius, and the month of Shivat, Shivat. And, and roughly the month of Shivat is February, January, February, about that time. So we got a time frame. It's taking place February of the year 1519, I'm sorry, the year 519 B.C. 519 B.C., 500 plus years before Christ. And it also tells us this thing is taking place at night. On the 24th day of the month of Shivat, the first vision comes to Zechariah at night now it says night i want you to notice that it doesn't say he's sleeping it is not a dream although it's taking place at night it is a vision he's seeing a vision okay now visions are not uh, they're not unusual to old testament prophets they see visions that uh, and they utter the thus says the lord uh, words of god but visions, when they saw visions, oftentimes had, dual, had a dual purpose. They served to present a statement to the people of that time. They're, they're speaking to the people of that time. And, and they're presenting a statement to the people of that time. But they also have a prophetic, they're a prophetic shadow of a reality that's still to come. A reality of, that's still to come. Now, if you if you heard, if you were back then and you heard this this utterance, this vision that he had, you could make sense of it back then, but you would never imagine what it was talking about for the reality still to come. For us looking back today, that's again, that's how we interpret these visions. Okay, that's how we're going to interpret all these visions that Zechariah has. We see the shadow and can interpret it with the reality of the New Testament, okay? So we're kind of on board with that. That's how we're looking at this. That's how we have to look at this. That's how Scripture tells us to look at it. A place we find that is in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. It says, For since the law 
has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. And it gives us an example. It, it tells us, it, it tells us it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now that was a shadow. Remember, that's in the Old Testament. That's a shadow of the reality of the perfect, supreme, ultimate sacrifice that was still to come in the New Testament, the man, Jesus Christ, the God-man. Uh, visions also are closely associated with apocalyptic literature in time writings. So when you see visions, oftentimes you, they're, they're associated with apocalyptic in time writings. It is said that apocalyptic visions basically represent the heavily pers uh, a heavily or the heavily perspective of earthly events. And it reveals to us the sovereignty of God in these apocalyptic visions. Okay. All right. So now we're getting into the setting, the layout of this drama. That's what we're kind of laying out. There's a lot more to it, but we're laying out the basic setting as it unfolds right before our eyes. This brings us to the circumstances of this first vision, which are found in verses 8 through 11. Again, picture what is happening. Put yourself there. Use your imagination. As you look at this vision, you see a man, a man riding a red horse, a man mounted on a red horse. And, and so you're looking at, okay, what does all this mean? Okay, you see a man riding a red horse. This is a picture of a red horse, a picture of authority, a warrior type, the color. You're trying to grasp that. And, and you have this man riding, not just riding, but it says he stands in the midst or among the myrtle, the myrtle trees in the glen. Now, uh, we'll talk about the myrtle trees in just a second, but we'll look at the glen. What does that mean? Well, a, a glen is a, is a ravine. It, it is a, low, a lower place, a ravine, a gully, if you will. Uh, it, it, can, it, it is, again, we're seeing imagery here. Okay, we're seeing imagery, so you have to interpret it by what you know in, the, in, in Scripture, and especially in the Old Testament. It is certainly revealing to us the low place of God's people, where they're at. Remember, they've been gone for 70 years, and although they tried to keep their, their, their religion together and worship God, many of them stopped. And they're in a very worldly, spiritually lowly place. The imagery is this man goes into the myrtle trees and the ravine and the glen in a low place where Israel, where the nation of Israel is, where the God's people are. The lowness of this ravine shows the status of God's people. The myrtle trees that we see, myrtle trees are basically evergreens. They're evergreens. Uh, and evergreens were plentiful in, the, in Israel, especially back then. So there's a lot of myrtle trees back then. But there's more of a meaning to it, okay? There's more of a meaning. It, it, these words are there for a reason. There's, there's imagery here. Again, the prophet Isaiah used the image of a myrtle tree to represent God's salvation and restoration. Isn't that interesting? Isaiah 55, 13 says, Instead of thorns shall come the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, the myrtle trees, as a vision, as, as imagery for God's restoration, God's salvation. Also, the branches of the myrtle tree were used by the people of God, the Israelites, to build booths. In the Feast of Tabernacle, they would build booths, these temporary shelters to remind them they were always on the run, these 40 years in the wilderness. So they would build these temporary shelters. They used myrtle trees as God tabernacled with them when they carry the Ark of the Covenant. If, if just a lot of imagery here. This man, 
this angelic being is mounted on a red horse. And we talked about what a, the, the significance of a red horse could be. But he is, again, in a lowly place, in a gully, in a ravine. Uh, the theologians have, again, have, have, have talked about the imagery there is because of the, the spiritually hostile deprivedness of the people of God at that point. They're spiritually deprived. Then, as we try to grasp everything that we're seeing now, we're seeing this man in a, in, riding a red horse, we're seeing him where he's at, and everything that's taking place. And what do we see after that? We see more horses. It talks about different color horses are behind this man. This, this, it later talks about the angel of God. There are, there are other horses. And by the way, theologians throughout history have said there are riders on these horses, but it doesn't talk about the riders. So now we're trying to go, what's going on? What is happening? We see these riders, these other horses, these riders on these other horses. Now, for Old Testament people, for Old Testament readers that, that would be reading this at the time it came out, the image of horsemen is not an unusual image. It is associated with the angelic legions of God's army. That it, it would be a, they would associate it with the angelic legions of God's army riding on horses. Now, where else do we see angelic beings riding on horses? In the New Testament, we see in the book of Revelation. By the way, you got to understand what's going on in Zechariah to understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. It, it just doesn't, if you read the book of Revelation just cold and never not know anything about Old Testament prophecy and visions and everything else, you're not going to understand what's going on. The book of Revelation, you're just going to make a bunch of stuff up. Or you're going to listen to crazies on TV talking about the things that it means and it signifies that it does not. So that's why we go through, that's why we have scripture. That's why we go through the book of Zechariah. After seeing all this, you can imagine the prophet Zechariah just looking at all this and going like, there's some confusion here. What is going on? What is happening? And he turns to an angel, his accompanying angel. By the way, he is accompanied by an angel who guides him along these, these visions. It's not the angel that's in the myrtle trees. It's a different angel, an accompanying angel guiding him along. So he asked the accompanying angel, what's, go what's going on? What does all this mean? And so the accompanying angel tells him, I will show you. We'll show you. But before that angel could say anything else, the man, and it says the man, not angel, it says the man who was standing among the myrtle trees. Remember, we, we said it was a man riding a horse. And we, but it's referred, he, it's, this man is referred to as the angel of the Lord. But here it says, the man. The man answers Zechariah. He answers Zechariah from the midst, from, the, from among the myrtle trees. And he says that these horsemen, these horses, patrol the earth. They go to and from the earth, to and fro, all over the earth. Kind of reminds us of Joel, the, the book of Job, uh, Joel, Job, no, Joel. And, and where, where the angels would go back and forth, even Satan had to give his account uh, of, of what, is, what he was doing and where he was going. Okay, so they, these angels are going back and forth to and fro to report back to the angel of the Lord, to this man, as to what is going on to give him a report. Okay, so now what we see is, is a couple of things. The first thing we need to address is this, this. It refers to him as a man, and it also refers to him as the angel of the Lord. We know, and it is referred, he is referred, this man is referred to as the angel of the Lord throughout the Old Testament. We know that person to be the second person of the Holy Trinity, the pre incarnate Jesus Christ. The pre incarnate Christ. Now, what do I mean by pre incarnate? Well, it, what, what, I, what I mean by that is it is the image of Christ before he became flesh and bone and born of a virgin. 
pre-incarnate, the embodiment of flesh. It is an image of Christ before he came in the flesh. Now, these horsemen have gone out and they've come back to the angel of the Lord. So they're going to, the, to Christ and giving him the report. And what do they tell Christ? They say this to him. They say, behold, all the earth remains at rest. All the earth remains at rest. Do you think that's a good report? I mean, I'm saying it's like a pretty good report. All the, report, all the earth remains at ease. It's at rest. But the reaction of the, of the angel of, of Christ is not good. It is a bad report. A bad report. Now we're getting into the, to, the, to the message of this vision. In verse 12, we see how the angel of the Lord, how this pre-incarnate Christ reacts, how he handles, how he handles this bad report. How does Christ handle this bad report that he gets from, the, from his horsemen? But before we look at that, I want to back up just a little bit, and, and I want to get into why is this a bad report? Why is it a bad report? The earth is at rest. The earth is at ease. Well, verses 14 and, and 15 tell us. It says that the, when, when this report is heard, the, the, it says that the Lord of hosts, now we're talking about Yahweh, Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of hosts looks at it, is angered, angered by this report. He's angered by this report. So you had the, the Son of God, Christ, angered by this report and, and realizing it's a bad report. And you have Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, who the, the angel of God is about to pray to, angry with this report. Now, why is it bad? Why are they angry? Well, because the world is at rest. The world is at peace, so to speak. It's not. But the world is at rest. The world is at ease while God's people are struggling. And God is a jealous God for his people. It, that is not a, hap, a good report. But it, it makes sense, right? It makes sense that the wicked, sinful people are at ease when they're in their sinfulness. In their sinfulness, they're at ease. They're at rest while they're sinning against God. And now you find that all over the earth and God's people are struggling. And God's not happy about that. He's not happy. He's not happy with this report. So that is why it's a bad report. God is angry. God is angry because the enemies of the Lord are at ease while his people are struggling. That's, that's kind of like end time revelation, right? The shadows of the end time revelation found in the book of Revelation as we read it. So the angel of the Lord, the, the pre-incarnate Christ, how does he handle this bad report? He does, he handles it through prayer. He, he prays. He makes intercession for God's people through prayer. Isn't that great? He prays to his Father for his people, for God's people. And he calls us. He says, cry out. He's telling us to pray too. Pray because of this bad report, because of all the struggles that are going on with the people of God, because they're trying to restart and get going again, because they've been through such a hard time. He's saying he prays for them and he calls out, cries out, pray, cry out. He's calling us to pray with them. That's how he handles it. Christ prays saying, oh, Yahweh, Yahweh of hosts, how long, how long will you have no mercy? No mercy on, your, on, on God's people. Christ is praying to his Father. Our Savior prays. And, and so that kind of, and he's calling us to pray with him. He's calling us to pray too. And, and it just kind of gives us a, it just kind of makes us ponder when we struggle, like we struggled this last week. Did we pray? Did we call out to God? And if you did, did you believe in the prayers that you were saying? Is it okay to call out to God, say, we're dying here. Uh, we, we're, we're not used to this. You, you have pampered us so much. 
that now we're struggling, right? And, and, we're, and we're dying. We can't handle the freeze. Did we pray? And if we prayed, which I'm sure we did, did you believe in your prayers? Yes, we, we, we have to be like that. And Paul talks about it. You have to pray without ceasing. You have to pray con continuously. We must pray. The beautiful things that are going on in this vision culminates with Yahweh, God responding to God, to our Christ, our Savior's prayer, to our prayers with our Savior. He responds. Yahweh of hosts responds to the prayer. He answers. He says, He says, uh, gracious and comforting words to us to in response to that prayer. Beautiful image. A beautiful image of Christ interceding for his people through prayer. We see Jesus do that in the New Testament. He prays for his people. He prays for his people. And he finally lays down his life for his people, interceding for his people. And then he, he, he dies and he's resurrected and he ascends into heaven where he's seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for his people praying for his people. That's what Christ does. That's what's going on in our passage. He lays down his life for the salvation of his people. He continues to intercede for us. So as we, we could go on forever, okay? So I'm going to try to start wrapping it up. So as we look back and we look at the passage, what do we need to, what do we need to see? What do we need to hear? What do we need to know? Well, we need to, we need to hear, we need to see that God makes a statement. Starts off by making a statement. He says, he, when, they're at, when, when Christ says, how long, how long will you have no mercy? And God says, how long will you be gone? And God says, I have returned. That's past tense, meaning he's there. We talked about past tense just a little while ago. The things that God has done. Well, God has already returned. He's brought his nation back from exile, and he's there waiting for them. He's among the myrtle trees waiting for them. So he's talking past us. He says, I'm already here. It's already happened. I've already returned. Not in the Christ, not in the, in the incarnation as of yet, but he's there already. And then God makes a promise. He makes a promise saying, my house shall be built. That's future tense. Future tense. Now, for them, they were rebuilding a temple. where That was their meeting place where they could worship God. For them, they, it, they finally built it. After 15 years, they started. And it took about five years to build it. And by the way, the temple that they built, compared to the Solomon Temple, was just like a, almost a shack. It was so small. But they did it. Okay, but, but God is speaking future tense. And now, again, remember, shadow re reality. God is saying, my house shall be built. God's house. In the reality that we know it today is not composed of clay or mortar or bricks. God's house, his church, is composed of living stones. You are the living stones. We are the living stones that build up this house, that build this house. When I say living stones, okay, here's a living stone. And you and I are living stones, okay? We're being shaped to build this house. We're being shaped and reshaped. We're, it's going to go on till we go to be with the Lord. For the rest of our lives, as we go through this process of sanctification, we as living stones are going to be shaped and reshaped and reshaped and remolded to be in the image of Christ. And it's going to continue. We're continually changing and growing in our spiritual, uh, in, in our spiritual walk with the Lord to be more like Christ-like. See, here there's a danger for some of us who think we have our theology rock solid. There's a danger for some of us that even get into Scripture and think we know it all. We don't. We can never stop growing in our theology. We can never stop growing in our theology understanding Christ and His Word. It is constant. If we think we got it figured out, we don't. Now, there, listen, there are non-negotiables. Yeah, there's non-negotiables, but we still grow spiritually. And that's the living stones. We're the living stones. We're continually being shaped and remolded as we build this house 
that God is talking about. See, we can rejoice because this is resurrection reality. Huh? Shadows reality, resurrection reality. It changed everything. Christ came. He became flesh. He laid down his life and was raised from the dead, never to die again. Raised. Resurrection. We too will never see eternal death. We'll spend eternity in the kingdom of God. Therefore, we have got to, as we walk with the Lord, we have to follow the pattern that Jesus is setting for us. We must be, we must live a life of prayer. Prayer. Listen, we cannot be deceived to think that our prayers don't matter. Yeah, you know, if I was never born, our prayers would, who cares? I mean, I pray, and I really pray, I pray a lot. But he doesn't really do anything. That's not what God's word says. That's not what this passage is telling us. Now, is God sovereign? Does he know the beginning from the end? Absolutely. But his sovereignty is beyond our comprehension because he commands us to pray. In his sovereignty, he's telling us, he's commanding us to pray. And, and it tells us that our prayers can and does make a difference. Don't buy into anyone that tells you, ah, your prayers, yeah, okay, but they don't make a difference. Now, if you're praying for stupid stuff, wicked stuff, give it up. Your prayers change things in God's sovereignty. How do we know that? It's, it's in the New Testament. The, the book of James is a great one to read about prayer. The book of James tells us, it says, the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. He goes on to say, if he has committed a sin, he will be forgiven. And when he's talking about prayer of the faithful, of faith. And it goes on to say, pray for one another. Pray for one another. You got a problem with somebody here? Pray for that person. Pray for that person. Don't try to change them. Guys, if you've ever been married, you know what I'm saying. You're not going to change somebody. You're not going to change your spouse. God does that. You pray for them. Pray for yourself because you're probably the one that needs to be changed anyway. But anyway, so let, that's another subject for another time. But hear this. Hear this. Hear this about how prayer makes a difference. And don't ever buy into the deception that your prayer does not make a difference. It says the prayer of the righteous person has great power. What more do you need to hear than that? Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, Manny, but what if they're praying stupid stuff like give me money or I want to be a millionaire? Hey, okay, God will take care of your prayers. Yeah, he'll handle that. The prayers of a righteous person, you are righteous in Christ. That's where you get your righteousness. Your prayers have power. Power. They make a difference. They can change things. The very end of the Bible. The very end. Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. Jesus is saying how he's going to return. He's already come. He's going to return. And it ends with a prayer. It ends with a prayer. It says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's a prayer. Have you prayed that prayer? Have you prayed the prayer for Jesus to come back? Have you prayed? Dare you pray it? Are you ready for Jesus to come back? Are you ready for him to return? First, you're called to pray for his return. In fact, the more we pray for his return, the, the chances are his, his coming back will come sooner than you think. But then the, then the question comes is, have you prayed that prayer, and are you ready when it happens? Are you ready when he returns? Oh, the love of God. Oh, his sov the sovereignty of God. It is beyond our, our, our comprehension. Beyond our comprehension. The mercy, God's mercy and grace comes only through Jesus Christ who intercedes for his people, thereby bringing forth an overflow of prosperity for all eternity. Praise God. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray.
Gracious Father, thank you for your love and thank you for your